Um, so welcome back to the second part. Um, we are still supervised learning examples, uh, combining supervised learning with DG schemes, shock capturing, so locating where a shock is uh, occurring in the flow in an element. And we've successfully done that. I've shown you how to do that on the previous uh, slide before the break. And now the idea is, can we not go one step further and do what I, what I proposed before, locate the shock on the sub-element level? So a single DG element would look like this. Those dots here, those points, are the inner collocation points. Think of interpolation points. You can see they are nice and they're not evenly spaced. They're nice Gaussian distribution because we also like, oh well, like good interpolation and integration properties. So they have this Gaussian sh uh, shape here. And the idea is now, from analytical data, we know where our shock fronts are. Can we not train a neural network that not just tells us, hey, this element here, there's a shock somewhere in there, but precisely where it is. So what, I'm, what we are trying to do now is input a solution, so not an image, I'm just showing it as an image so you can, can visualize what's going on, directly input our tensor product structure data, our data points. <coughs> we know for our training data where the shock front is, we can locate it to the closest interpolation node and then train our neural network to do that. So essentially what I'd like my network to predict is, we call it the binary edge map. Essentially, okay, I'm detecting the edge will be bounded by these interpolation points. And this is um, the, basic, the basic idea and the basic setup. So again, turn it into a supervised learning problem. Now live with a little bit of a twist. And this would of course be very, very beneficial because then we could target our shock capturing precisely to where the shock is located. The way we did that, <laughs> we cheated a bit. Uh, and the cheating is actually already in the name here, binary edge map, because we recognized that this is a problem that has been solved by other machine learning um, researchers <coughs> under a different name, and that is edge detection in images. Right? So we have a, an image and you want to detect some edges around an object and there is a ton of literature on how to do proper edge detection. And we had a look at that and we thought, hey, there is one idea which we can work on and, and essentially modify to our, um, to our concerns, to our needs. And that's, um, it's called HED, Holistic Edge Detector. I forgot to put the correct reference here. It's not by us, it's by another group. But if you, if you look up HED, Holistic Edge Detection, you will find the original author. I apologize for that. Um, so we, we, we uh, borrowed some ideas from this paper and transferred that to the idea of detecting shocks in flows. The basic concept is that it's not it's not formulated like that in the paper, but it's my interpretation. The basic idea is to say edges or shocks are scale invariant. So no matter how close you zoom in or far you zoom out, essentially, a shock is a shock is a shock, or an edge is an edge is an edge. And this can be used in a multi-scale CNN, which you see on the right-hand side, which is essentially doing the convolution operator on different levels of coarsening or refinement, however you want to look at it. So essentially taking this idea, and then at each of these layers, this is just a standard convolutional forward pass, and at each of the layers you have an, essentially a, an outbranching, and you look at the prediction on each level, on each layer, on each scale, if you want to call it that. And you can see these outbranchings here, so you input something like this, and on each of these convolutional levels, your field of, uh, field of receptivity is of course changing, but an edge is an edge is an edge is an edge. And then you concatenate all of these, so kind of, uh, yeah, sum them up and see where they agree on. And this will give you a nice estimate of where the edge, the edge, excuse me, is actually located. So we took the idea from this paper here, we reformulated it and um, put it into what we call multi-scale CNNs. And then we apply that to our learning problem again. Same set of data, same idea. 
And you can see here the training, again, was pretty successful, just based on the, on the training F-score, uh, sorry, on the training metric. And we're able to also get the same uh, properties with respect to the invariances as the previous case, where we only had the detection in the element, no retraining, no parameters. And there it is, the question you asked, for a given n. So for a given n, you have to train it once, and then, so for a given polynomial degree, and then you can run it. And here are some of the results, uh, which uh, actually exceeded my expectations. I wasn't expecting it to be this good. So what you see here is on the left-hand side, again, the double Mach reflection case. Left is the density field, and you can, of course, just by the color gradient, see what's going on. And in the middle, these are three consecutively refined grids. In this case, they are nice and structured, but we'll come to that later. And you can see that the, well, first of all, the, uh, the simulation runs. It doesn't crash, as which is the first thing to note, which is not a given, <laughs> so I'm glad about that. And the second thing is this gives you nice, consistent, continuous shock fronts. So this is exactly what we had hoped for, and we were pretty happy when we saw these results. So remember, the input into each of these uh, networks is just essentially a local cell, so one of these little squares here, the solution in these squares here. And the output is now where within each element which collocation nodes are closest to the actual shock location. And if you look at this, this is really nice, continuous, and consistent. There are no kinks and jumps in, in this. This actually works very, very robustly. And if I, <coughs> excuse me, if I refine the grid, not changing anything, these positions also converge very nicely to what I would expect. So this is, um, yeah, this was very, uh, as I said, pretty surprised by how well this works. Um, and it also worked on unstructured <laughs> grids for the reason we discussed previously. Uh, for each of these oddly shaped hexas, we do the training, or we transfer the solution to a cube reference space. And then we do all the training on this reference space and we just apply the Jacobian essentially back. So you can see here, it's a little airfoil. Um, supersonic flow is coming from the left. And the grid that I'm using here, that's intentionally bad. So if I were to set this up um, to, to run a real simulation, I would never use such a bad grid here, very large grid cells and not very nicely built. But you can see again how this shock indicator works even for really coarse grid cells, right? This guy here is very, very large up here. Um, and it gives us a nice, almost continuous, smooth uh, shock detection. Down here, it doesn't detect shocks anymore because the uh, numerical dissipation essentially has already moved this shock into the smooth region or to a smooth solution field. So this is already a great, yeah? Um, I'm not working in CFD, so I apologize if my question is really naive, no but uh, it seems to me that um, you assume that a shock is like binary, either uh, it's zero or one, and we want to capture uh, exactly a, a vertical step. Mm -hmm. And so does it work if we have like a very high gradient Going from zero to one. Yes, it doesn't have to go from zero to one. It can yes, yeah. yeah, yeah. It, it's renormalized. Um, that, of course, in in our codes or in our schemes, um, shocks are, um, as you said, they are either perfectly captured as a discontinuity, or they are usually captured as very steep gradients. So they are represented as very steep gradients already. So the sh short answer is yes, this, this also works if the gradient is very steep. I cannot tell you how steep the gradient can be or not be. Uh, so what's, what's the, where's the tipping point? I don't know that for that specific model. But um, coming to the assumption of uh, invariance by resolution, if you have a sharp gradient and the resolution is very, very small, 
then you are seeing in one cell you have values that are not very different like you can put have like 0.8 and 0.9 and so is the algorithm uh, like the ml model able to detect that such a small variation is already a shock because it's like only a s small vision of a stroke. That's, that's the reason we, we, when we trained on the analytical data, which we knew was shocked or not shocked, we projected this data onto our polynomials. So things like you, you describe already occurs also for under-resolved smooth data, right? Smooth polynomial, but we are under-resolving this polynomial, so there are already appearing jumps uh, in the training data. So the, the short answer is, um, yes, it is built into the training process. Can I give you exact bounds <coughs> when it detects something as a shock and when not? not? No, I, I, cannot, I cannot do that. Mm -hmm. But this idea of multi-scale networks here, that only applies to a single, a single element. So a single situation like this, where the only thing that this multi-scale CNN is doing is essentially changing the field of receptivity. So it's looking, first of all, essentially on, on, this, uh, on this region here for shock. Then it's zooming out, looking on this region, zooming out on this region. But it stays on the same solution. It just changes the scale at which it looks at. Okay, I have a question. Do you have the same kind of results for a 3D computation? Um, no, we don't. <laughs> we, haven't, we haven't done a 3D computation with this setup yet. Okay. Thank you for the for the for the question. Um, actually, this the reason we don't have a three D computation is this was all part of a master's thesis uh, project that came out of this, and then the master student <laughs> was finished. So, at the moment, it's uh, it's as it is. Um, maybe we'll have time to continue it at a later point. But what I wanted to show you is how we can now use this information to make the numerical scheme better. So we started from a numerical scheme that has some parameters we need to fiddle with. Now we have the parameters in place and we can do shock detection on a sub-element level. Can we now go the opposite way and actually improve the shock capturing? And um, I've shown you before that we have different ways of doing shock capturing, like disc discretization-based or regularization-based, artificial viscosity-based. And we just went with the most basic one for this case. And we said, OK, let's see if we can improve the classical artificial viscosity shock capturing method. So as I said, most basic idea, I think invented in the 40s, 50s, um, is OK, I'll add a regularization term, second order diffusion term to my uh, hyperbolic equation. And that will make sure that all uh, sharp gradients are essentially made smooth. And what I need to specify to do that, because this is just a numerical uh, diffusion, is some artificial viscosity parameter, right? This is, not a, this is not a physical thing. It's an artificial smoothing factor. So I need to specify where this artificial viscosity is going to be applied. And the current state of the art in the DG methods was OK, we'll take an element-wise constant artificial viscosity, so keep the, the uh, factor constant in each element, and then do a linear continuous reconstruction to the surrounding elements. Or use other uh, PDE-based smoothing methods, but start with a constant artificial viscosity in the cell and then kind of smear it out. And what we seek now is a more localized, smooth distribution of this viscosity coefficient. And this is not machine learning now. This is just how we incorporate this information into our uh, numerical scheme. And the idea was pretty simple. Well, we use a radial basis function reconstruction of my, or interpolation, of my artificial viscosity field, where I know that where my shocks are detected, essentially my artificial viscosity should be one or whatever, whatever scaling I use, right? There, there precisely where I have detected my shock, there I'd like my artificial viscosity to smear out the gradient. And I'd like to go that smoothly to zero away from that. So the idea is construct a viscosity field based on an RBF interpolation 
and the nodes of the RBF, or the, the quotient, essentially the interpolation points, they are now the shocks that I have detected. Um, if you do this RBF interpolation, you get a weakly coupled von der Monde matrix, and uh, we did some, um, some manipulations on that and reducing it to local problems, but um, this is just a, a technical details on how to solve that. So, <coughs> excuse me. Um, we use different types of um, uh, radial basis functions with compact support, uh, a C0 continuous one, essentially a linear one, which you can see here, and a C2 continuous one, um, which you can see down here for our experiments. And let me show you some results. So again, the, the basic idea is machine learning um, model runs alongside the computation, tells you at each element and at each step in time where within the element the shock will be located. And now I'll use this RBF idea to generate viscosity fields that are smooth and highly localized. And let's see what, uh, how, this, uh, how this works. Well, the first, these are taken from a, from a paper, so I apologize for the change in format a little bit. Um, so this is first for a SOT a shock cube case. And what I'm comparing is the reference in gray, which I realize is hard to see, but trust me, it's there, with the classical state-of-the-art approach, taking an element-wise constant artificial viscosity, and our approaches. So you can, if you compare the red one to the blue and the green one, zoom into the contact discontinuity here, we can see, first of all, or let's first stick with the overview here, we can see, well, this still works. <laughs> it still solves um, the such shock problem um, in, a, in a meaningful way. And if we zoom in on the contact discontinuity, we can actually see that uh, our new approach is actually gives us sharper shocks than the established method. If we take another example, Shuosha shock interaction case, um, we get essentially the same result. So gray is again the reference solution. The red one is the current state of the art. And the blue and the green ones, and particularly the C2 continues, the high order um, RBF approach that we use, gives us these much sharper wiggles here as opposed to the standard method. Let me, let, me, let me make this clear so it's not confusing. Everything else in the scheme is the same. We use the same baseline scheme, same um, artificial viscosity method. The only thing that's changing is where do we put the artificial viscosity? And machine learning, or the method that we showed, that tells us that. And looking a little bit deeper into the code, we can now see why these machine learned um, artificial viscosity is indeed gives us sharper gradients. If we zoom into the shock and we're looking at this mu as this artificial viscosity field added, you can see that the classical approach, the red one here, uh, works as intended. Where the shock is, give you continuous um, level of artificial viscosity in the element and then do a nice smoothing through linear reconstruction. That's the red curve here. And now with the RBF approach, taking advantage of that we know where the shock is precisely here at this position, we can now target the artificial viscosity right to the shock front, and that's the blue line here. So you can see instead of applying the artificial viscosity in this red region or under this red curve, we only put it there where the blue curve is telling us, or the blue RBF distribution is telling us to do. And this is the only difference between the blue and the red approach, and you can see it's nicely improving. Yeah. I, I was. I, I'm not extremely familiar with the artificial viscosity in DG, but uh, do the established uh, Peterson, for instance, have any TVD properties or something like that? Not many. Not exactly TVD, maybe, but um, some kind of monotonicity. Uh. I don't think they do. Okay. I don't <coughs> think they do. I'm not 100% sure, but from the original paper, it's not in there. Okay. So I don't think they do. And what I'm wondering, why I'm wondering that is, since you are way sharper, mm -hmm. you may go out of bounds of your uh, contact discontinuity or mm -hmm. your shock mm -hmm. wave. And so that could be uh, a pain yeah. in some simulations. Yeah. So do you have um, a way to try to keep it in bounds? Um, no, honestly, uh, not, not, uh, not at this point. 
um, the way this was set up and trained, as I said, was a master student project and it kind of ended. Um, so no, we didn't, it's, a, it's the short answer. But that's a good, that's a good uh, addition to, to think about. Um, I mean, the idea would, ideally, you would want to not want to combine this with artificial viscosity. I think that's not where the strengths are, but the idea would be to combine this with a finite volume subgrid capturing. Um, that would be much more intelligent and much more robust. And um, we didn't do it at the time, and we haven't done it for, for, for time reasons, but um, this was, and we never do, we actually never do artificial viscosity based shock capturing. Precisely for the reasons you mentioned, it's always fiddling and it's never TVD guaranteed. Um, so, short answer, it would be much, it would be promising to do this with finite volume shock capture. Okay, oops. Um, so, again, showing some Riemann problems, how this works in practice, 2D Riemann problems, and you can see here on the right hand side the artificial viscosity field that we are generating. So, you can see it's nice and smooth and it's um, it's probably not visible in this, on this beamer, um, but it gives us an inner element artificial viscosity distribution and not just constants. Okay, two more examples or two more uh, plots here. The first one is for the, um, or both of them actually are, for the forward facing step. And here I'm contrasting what, what we just said. Here I'm contrasting my artificial viscosity-based shock capturing with this machine learning approach, and the old approach with just switching to a finite volume scheme and doing shock capturing that way. And you can see that, well, the solutions um, look reasonable. You can see that uh, the shock fronts here are, of course, that's just the name of the beast uh, or the name of the game, they uh, are more dissipative, more smeared out than for a finite volume shock capturing, but as I mentioned before, this you can implement in half a day, this you can implement in half a year, maybe, approximately, how, how uh, complex this is. And the last, uh, or oh, second um, uh, look at this is for a coarser mesh, right? So this is a really coarse mesh. This is one element here. And usually when you run this, uh, this case and you see results in literature, this is run for a resolution that's maybe 10 times that the one I'm showing here. So it's a really coarse mesh. But what you can see is, that's the reason I'm showing it, that we indeed have which in, within a single element, we can nicely and stably capture a shock. And that's not something that is, that is uh, typical for DG schemes. So we have a nice inner element uh, shock capturing as we set out to do. Okay, final slide about this. Again, uh, the NACA uh, airfoil case Again, showing here gives a nice, even on this unstructured and, and rather bad grid, gives us a nice smooth uh, solution and also a rather smooth artificial viscosity distribution. So here's just looking on a, as I said, on a really bad unstructured grid. And this is this artificial viscosity field that we actually recreate, A, by knowing where the shock is precisely, and B, by uh, adding RBF interpolation to give us local and smooth results. Okay, I want to sum up this, uh, this brief example. Um, what, I, what I'd like to, us to take away from this is, this is an example for a typical offloading empirical knowledge to a machine learning model. So putting thought into how to generate the data. We are lucky here we could generate the data analytically for supervised learning. So you can offload this fiddling, this parameter searching, um, can offload this to uh, the machine learning. And then we actually used this machine learning, coupled it to the CFD scheme, and did something useful with that, not just that we can use uh, shock capturing without playing with the parameters, but also use the information provided by the machine learning to get better accurate, at least in 2D, uh, shock capturing schemes um, in theory. So this is actually something where you <laughs> have machine learning, you put it back into the solver and it works and it gives you something useful. Um, which is not, which is at least in my experience, um, not always the case. So that's, the, that's one of the nice examples I wanted to, to show you and also maybe how to take ideas from the whole field of machine learning and try to think about how you can formulate that for your own or reformulate that for your own problem. 
And the next example, this is shorter than the previous one, and that has to deal with uh, wall models and wall models uh, in the sense of particle wall interactions. So what you see here are um, some uh, flows over a cylinder up here, and what you visualized here in the wake are just particles. So particles advected by the velocity field. And the topic of wall models comes into play when you have, well, particles interacting with walls. That's, again, the typical macro-micro scale problem. You don't want to go down into the um, contact mechanics of having to resolve an individual particle of crazy shape interacting with a wall, which also is a rough surface, and then all kinds of crazy things happen. At least not if you want to use or if you want to run simulations that tell you something about how a bunch of particles behaves in a fluid situation. The reason we are interested in that is turbo machines. So when you, when you have a, a rotating geometry, for example, you have a jet engine, and you taxi or you land on a runway, and it's pretty dusty, you will ingest a lot of sand into that engine, and the sand works like, well, sandpaper, essentially. It erodes your geometry, and that can lead to structural failure and accidents. Uh, and understanding how that happens, so how particles interact with fluids in such a situation, that is what we are after. So this is where the, wh what I mean by wall models in that sense. I'm going to show you a video now that kind of nicely visualizes uh, how particles, how complex particle behavior is in such a turbo machinery case. I made this video f as a Christmas special, <laughs> and you can probably tell why. There's actually, sound, there's actually sound there as well, which you cannot hear. These are real particles. This is a real LES, uh, except for this one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you can see it was, a, it was a, a, a Christmas special. So these are the types of flows we are interested in. And what happens? Maybe I can go back and show it again. Just look at the particles, not at Santa Claus. Um, and you can kind of tell that there's something really, you know, a lot of particle wall interactions. Some are flying off here. And this is just a single turbine stage. And now in a real turbo machine, you have five or 10 or whatever, 15 of these stages with, with stators uh, in between interacting. So particle wall interactions, getting them right, is really important. OK, so this is the, the real scientific uh, <laughs> thing we're after. Um, erosion due to ingested particles can limit the lifespan. Um, there is a, an Icelandic volcano that was pretty famous for grounding all flights over the Atlantic precisely due to this, uh, this problem. We had, of course, not just sand, but ash particles and stuff. So if I want to compute flows as the one we've seen before, I need to have wall models for individual particle wall interactions, meaning Particle comes in, hits the wall at a certain angle and velocity. How will it reflect or rebound, is the term, off the wall? What will, will it rotate? Will it break up? And what will happen? Uh, here you can see an example of just a plate we put into a particle wind tunnel, and then we essentially blew sand at it. And you can see how the erosion then grinds away the material. Uh, so w we actually approached this together with people doing experiments. So this will be an example where we use experimental data in machine learning uh, and how we, how we wrangle the data to do machine learning with that. So we have an experimental setup where people at our university who know a lot more about particle wall interactions did experiments for us. Essentially, we put flat plates in there and then uh, pushed a bunch of, or shot a bunch of particles at them. Um, what makes this very tricky for those of you who are experimentalists these particles in turbo machines, they are a lot faster than uh, what you would normally measure. So they come really fast. They're flying in transonic speeds. So measuring them is very, very tricky. You cannot follow them, really. You have to essentially do, do two, uh, two pictures and then kind of correlate them. So this makes measuring a challenge. But that's not what I want to talk about here. So our idea was, OK, we have measurement data. Incoming particle distributions, outgoing particle distributions. Can we fit a supervised model to that to help us with particle wall interactions? So again, this micro model to bridge the scale gap idea that I talked about before. 
And the current state of the art is, again, pretty sad. Um, that's 1D polynomial fits. And how bad these are, you can see here. So this is actually uh, the angle, so the reflection angle over the uh, reflection velocity. The black dots are what we measured for different, so this is the low speed case, this is the high speed case. And while you can argue that for the low speed case, these two models from literature, current state of the art, uh, they are kind of there. When we go to high speed, you can see they're essentially pretty useless to, to use. So we thought, can we do this with machine learning? And our modeling approach um, is now a little bit, and this is where we needed to put our thinking caps on, a little bit uh, tricky because we don't have individual particle data, uh, but we need in individual particle data for the computation. I have a particle coming in in my flow solver and it has to have some, has to go off the wall in some sense. Um, but we only have distributions that we can measure due to the measurement limitations. So we need to create sample pairs, physically reasonable sample pairs for supervised learning. And this is essentially where the difficulty in this type of machine learning actually lay. How do we find plausible distributions or how do we find plausible particle pairs for the incoming to the outgoing particle if we only have access to essentially PDFs or CDFs? Um, and the idea we came up with was to generate conditional PDFs uh, from the data by enforcing physical constraints. I'm sorry, the other picture is a little bit over the, over the uh, text there. Enforcing physical constraints for these PDFs. And one idea, for example, is to say, well, if I have a particle, it hits the wall and it leaves the wall, first simplest physical constraint would be, well, it doesn't become bigger <laughs> in doing that. It only becomes smaller. So the diameter or reference diameter should only decrease and not increase. Second idea was, well, the kinetic energy should also not increase, but only decrease. There are, we have about six or seven other um, conditions in this PDF or in this, um, in this setup. I'm just pointing out the two most uh, easily understandable ones here. So this was purely a pre-processing, essentially, of experimental data to make it fit into a supervised learning style to create individual sample pairs to draw from. And here are some examples. This is a very small, it's an MLP, three layers, a thousand neurons, very, very small uh, uh, machine learning method. Two million training samples from the, from the experimental data that we got. And let's first evaluate our model a priori. So just take particle data and see how it does. Um, I'll make it short, left and right, uh, sorry, middle and right is the classical models we've seen fail before. They fail here as well, and this is our a priori matched training data. So the blue is the model prediction, and the light gray one is the actual measured particle distribution. So it's essentially showing the success of the supervised learning. Um, and then we also did a posteriori tests, so we ran this whole wind tunnel or, or particle wind tunnel here as an LES computation. So you can see the whole thing meshed up here. Uh, you can see it's really a nice uh, jet coming out and the plate, so this, this object that we are hitting uh, is about there, it's not showing here. So this is what this looks like when you, when you run it. Um, there comes the jet, there come the particles, and then you can look at the incoming and outgoing particle distributions. And here is again the comparison for this a posteriori evaluation uh, for our new model versus the uh, classical standard one. So left hand side, little bit busy plot. The interesting part is just this is what the model predicted the particles would do when they come off the blade or off the plate. This is what the experiment measured. So these light gray to light orange uh, distributions. And on the right-hand side here, you can see this is what we're actually able, in an a posteriori fashion, uh, able to predict. So this was a lot simpler to learn, and the model was a lot simpler than the previous one with the shock capturing. It's just an MLP, and we just predict uh, an angle and a velocity. 
but the, the takeaway message here is um, think about how to include experimental data, how to maybe condition your experimental data so it uh, fits your problem, and here's a nice result for a very simple, tiny building block, Lego block machine learning model you can put in there and use. Oh, okay, there's something missing. Never mind. Um, and what we're currently doing, just, just for, for those interested, um, so this is a c compressor blade, and this is an uneroded blade, and here you can see that the surface is starting to erode, so given those particle interactions, we know essentially what the kinetic energy loss is. We can translate that into an erosion. And you can see that this edge here is starting to kind of become rough. Um, we're actually measuring, or sorry, actually simulating the reduction in the, in the geometry here. You can kind of see that by the waves generated here at this rough surface compared to here. So we're interested in understanding how this now actually relates to um, a real reduction in geometry. So this was a short one, uh, short and sweet, um, what you, where you have a building block, uh, MLP in this case, that solves a tiny problem that you have, where you have a lot of data available uh, from experiments, and how you can use that now to improve your simulation rather drastically. And the, the, the key message is we incorporated the physical constraints here, not in the machine learning model, but in the selection of the data itself. You made the data plausible for the machine learning model and then just trained on that as is. Okay, now I come to my favorite subject, uh, which is turbulence closures from data. Um, this is maybe a little bit of a, well, in fluid mechanics, it's, it's a wide known problem, maybe a little bit of a special problem for those of you not working in turbulence, so I'll, I'll try to give an intro. Um, and it, again, of course, fits under the topic of the scale gap. So, turbulence is, I mean, we've seen a lot, we've seen a lot of turbulent flows here already, so you already have the feeling of what a turbulent flow looks like, a very nearly chaotic multi-scale in nature, a lot of uh, temporal and, and spatial scales all interacting all driven, the interaction, driven by non-linearity, generation of these scales, interaction of the scales, driven by non-linearity. So this is here a slice through a turbulent field, through a simple, it's called turbulence in a box, it's a simple triple periodic box of a turbulent flow. You can see all the features appearing there, and resolving all of them on this level, on this u small l level is only possible for very low Reynolds numbers. One can argue with, what I, with me what I mean by very low. It's pushed uh, every, with every uh, generation of supercomputers, but uh, we will still not be able to compute the flow around a full aircraft um, in the next 20 years or so, maybe in the next 40 years, or maybe quantum computers will change everything. But in the foreseeable future, for as long as I want to do fluid mechanics, we still will not be able to do that. So we have to come up with some, again, coarse graining of the equations, solving some reduced set, in whatever sense, of the equations, um, which solve the problem for a coarse grained solution field, typically the velocity field, UL. This might then look like this, right? You can see it's, well, looks like a filtered field, or filtered version of this one, this is, or a, a low order version of this one, which is precisely what it is, plus some closure terms, which account for the effect of those unresolved nonlinear scales on this coarse grain field. These guys are called, depending on whether you put them inside or out of the side of the divergence, called the Reynolds stresses or the Reynolds forces, Typically, people talk about the Reynolds stresses or use the Reynolds stress formulation. And it's essentially, um, well, if you want, the footprint of the fine scales on the coarse scales. So these are unknown, generally, unless you have access to this data, to this already fine data. You cannot compute them because they are nonlinear interactions of the fine scale solution projected onto the coarse scale. 
So nonlinearity and filter do not commute. So you don't know these guys unless you have already solved the problem up here, which makes solving this problem obsolete. So the problem is I want to solve the equation on this level without knowing these guys, but modeling this term here. I've expressed this, this notion that actually I would need to have access to the fine scale data by the arguments. This model, or this, this actual correct model, perfect model, is a function of both u l, u small l and u large l, right? So having access to this data would allow you to compute this term. But in general, when we only run the equations on the course level, you don't know that what this small uh, u small l is. Probably overexplained this, but OK. So people have been trying to find closure models for both the RANDs and the LES equations for these terms uh, for decades um, with very limited and varying success. And in recent years, of course, there has been the idea of, hey, let's do this data driven. And that's what I want to talk about for now. So be warned, LES is ahead. Those of you working with RANDs, um, I'm an LES person and I know <laughs> not very much about RANDs. So I will be talking about the LES side of things here. Um, I should have mentioned the name, sorry about that. Uh, LES stands for Large Eddy Simulation. And the basic idea is to introduce a spatial filter, usually written as this convolution operator here, has some filter width that takes in the full solution field and outputs this filtered solution field that has this overbar. So this is going back. This would be the input, and I'm applying a convolution operator with certain properties that define them as a filter, and out comes this coarse grained version or the smoothed or filtered version, whatever you want to call it. So you're filtering out, essentially it's a low pass filter, so you're filtering out all this high frequency, high modal content in your solution. And when you apply this filter to the governing equation, because remember we want this coarse graining operator to define what my evolution equation at the course level actually is. So when you apply this and you look into a textbook, um, this is what comes out of it. So these are the uh, momentum equations of the incompressible Navier-Stokes equations written in this filter form here, where again this overbar denotes this is the filtered quantity. And this nonlinearity that I talked about, this problem, this need for coming up with a closure, comes from this term here. If you look at this term here, and it's a little bit written, could have written it a little bit more clear manner. If you introduce this tau here, this tau is actually u u bar minus u bar u bar. And this appears here on the right hand side. It's just an addition of this, of this double term here. And the problem is now that this guy here, right, that's the commutation error, essentially this expression there, describes the commutation error between the nonlinearity of the physics and the filter. So that's not something you can ever. Um, essentially, no, we need to compute the nonlinearity of the full solution and then filter it, and that's not the same as this guy. Okay, so essentially the closure problem for LES is a problem of finding a commutation error or an expression for a commutation error. So what people do is they come up with models for this term, try to fit some, some models uh, for that, and that's then what's called closure modeling or LES modeling. And the reason behind that is, well, um, turbulence, ha turbulence has this nice property that essentially only the large scales are relevant energetically and are anisotropic energetically, meaning that if I resolve the large scales correctly, then the effect of the small scales that I'm kicking out, it's Iso it's almost isotropic or can be isotropic in certain uh, cases. Well, let me put it the other way around. Can be <laughs> isotropic under certain conditions. Usually it's isotropic. Um, and it's mostly just acting as a dissipation mechanism. Okay, So I know things about what I'm throwing away. Um, and that allows me to model this 
based on physical and mathematical reasonings. Again, showing just, for, just to, to visualize stuff, here is this, or here in the back, would be the U field U of R, and the front here would be once I have passed the filter, this operation here over this field. And the, the flow down here over a cylinder is just showing what a typical solution looks like for an LES. So you can see you're still resolving the larger scales in the flow, but you're neglecting the smaller scales in the flow, which would look like this. So those of you who know more about LES, I apologize for this uh, maybe oversimplified uh, introduction, but um, I think it uh, at least gives, an, gives you a feeling for what's going on. OK, and now let's come to um, a little bit of a pet peeve of mine, which is when I was a PhD student, I tried to run the very simplest of turbulent flows. Uh, oops, sorry. Precisely this cylinder flow. Everybody who's probably ever worked with LES knows even the Reynolds number of this guy by heart because it's the classical case that you run. Very simple. There is the DNS up there. You can see the cylinder. Well, you cannot really see it, but it would be located here. Flow comes from the left, and then it produces this rich structure. This is a full resolution. So this is solving this on the U small l level. And I'm looking for now the solution on this U capital L level, this LES solution. So something like this here, right? Still, uh, coarse scales are there, but not everything. And when you do that, and you check literature, and you compare a very simple metric, which is the center line velocity, the mean center line velocity, so essentially the mean velocity down this line here behind the cylinder. Integral quantity should be very well behaved. And you compare that to literature, you see uh, essentially an appalling um, yeah, shift or an appalling drift or an appalling discrepancy between those results. And the worst thing about this is the red and the blue curve, they are mine. <laughs> I computed them. And I was sure I was doing the right thing. And even they don't agree. <laughs> and none of the curves agree. I've collected here Stanford guys and Jochen Fröhlich guys and, and uh, Stefan Hickel et, et al. So people who know what they are doing in terms of LES. And none of them agrees. And none of them agrees with the experimental data. So there's something that is bothering me about this plot. And the problem, what I think going, is going on here, is um, in the definition of LES. And I'll apologize to those who are more here for the, for the machine learning part, not too much for the LES part. I'll, I'll need two more slides, and then we can go back to machine learning. Um, it's in the definition of the LES. I've talked about how we define this coarsening operator, this filtering operator, in such a nice convolutional manner. But if you actually check out what is happening in real life computations, you see that there are two variants of LES being done. One being done 99.5% on Google Scholar and the other one is being 0.5% on Google Scholar. And the difference is, on the left-hand side, we have what is called explicitly filtered LES. And in a nutshell, this means I'm actually computing this convolution integral and taking my solution, I'm convolving it, and I'm actually computing my filtered solution. This means that I have a separate H, my grid spacing, and a separate or my, my grid spacing is separate from my filter width, meaning that I can actually converge my solution under my filter. So my filter width has nothing to do with my grid spacing. Also means I can choose any numerical scheme that is consistent that I want. It should convert, all of them should converge to the same solution if I just do an H convergence. They will converge at a different rate, but that doesn't matter. Meaning that this codization scheme is not relevant for this case. You have to care about boundary conditions and about the filter and the realizability of the filter kernel. But um, essentially, 
the most important problem maker is out of the picture, and that is the discretization scheme. And the second method, and that's the one that everybody's using, that's called implicitly filtered LES. And the idea here is, well, your discretization operator is also your filter, right? Your discretization operator already reduces the continuous problem to a discrete problem. So that is a loss of information, which is the most basic definition of a filter. Meaning that the grid spacing, H, and the filter width are joint. They are, well, they're not the same thing precisely, but they are somewhere similar, somewhat similar. Meaning that I can no longer H converge my solution. Because every time I refine my grid, well, my filter width changes accordingly. The only convergence I can do is towards the DNS, but that's, that's uh, meaningless. So the discretization scheme defines the filter kernel. The discretization scheme tells me, I don't know what it is, that's another point. The discretization scheme actually tells me what this G up there look like, looks like. So I have this problem to deal with, plus I have discretization, sorry, I have this problem here to deal with, plus I have discretization parameters and errors that come from my filter definition. Okay. And now, I call this the dilemma. If you follow my discussion from before and if you look into a textbook, the unclosed terms, the ones you don't know, they look like this. They come from pure physics and the non-commutation of the filter and the non-linearity. So if you open a textbook on LES, they tell you the unknown term is this one or these are the Reynolds stresses. So these are the ones you have to model. Where in truth, from the discussion previously, and I'll talk more on this after the break, this is the actual term that you should be considering. Again, more on this later. For now, we'll pretend that we are after the Reynolds stresses and the Reynolds stresses only. Okay, so basic idea, machine learning, supervised learning, we're still stuck with supervised learning here. Basic idea, well, very simple. I compute a bunch of these fine scaled solutions on the UL level, U small l, bunch of DNS data for simple turbulence in a box. I compute my coarse grid data from there. So I apply this filter here, right, yeah, this operation. I compute my coarse grid data and I compute the exact closure terms, which I can do because I have access to the fine scale solution already. And now I do supervised learning. So I have all the data I need, the exact data I need, the perfect data on the U capital L level. And now I do supervised learning, input the grid data, coarse grid data, output this Reynolds stresses. And I'll show that for two approaches. The first one is, let's approximate that from pure spatial data only with a CNN or from temporal data with a GRU or an LSTM approach. Um, let's see how that goes. So from now on, well for this part, we'll only consider those Reynolds terms, right? So this is the formulation we're after, U U bar minus U bar U bar, pretending that that is the true closure term. Okay, so let's now start. Um, this is essentially just repeating, to set up the scene again, what we're trying to do. Compute a lot of turbulent flows like this, apply the coarsening operator to get these two fields, and then learn a mapping between this guy and this guy based on the data. And we do this for a very simple flow. Essentially, all of what I will be showing from now on will just be a rather boring turbulence in a box flows. They serve as the, well, they remove all the influence of the boundary conditions, which we know <laughs> is a good thing, and they're essentially the most basic building blocks of turbulence. Now come some technical slides, or technical aspects, and I'll skip over them rather quickly. We actually compute a bunch of these uh, flow simulations, and we make sure they are physically sound, and just to show you that uh, supervised learning can get expensive if you have to create the data, so you need about 500,000 something CPU hours just to compute 25 realizations of this turbulence in a box to gather the data. Um, depending on how much 
computing power you have and what you have access to, this can be a, this can essentially, uh, yeah, make this approach already uh, undoable. And by, and by the way, this is one of the biggest criticisms uh, I also have for supervised learning for these types of problems. People tend to produce amounts of huge databases and then train models uh, on that database. But the relationship between the computing power you put into training, uh, sorry, into, into generating the data and the, the speed up you gain from the model, it's maybe not always justified. Okay. Um, so, we set out to predict now the, where is it? Um, up, 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 up. These are my input features, sorry. So we set out to predict those Reynolds stresses from the input being just the velocities and some other gradients, flow gradients that we, uh, that we computed. And we always wanted to do that for a single element. So I'm choosing one of my single elements, these little cubes here. And in each of these cubes, because I'm running the DG scheme I presented before, I have, I think in this case, six cubed solution points. So again, this idea of have tiny little tensors. Uh, and for each of the tensor, I'm putting in the full information, getting out the Reynolds stresses for this tensor. And the idea here being, well, convolutional neural networks take care of non-locality. Uh, it's a pretty old, uh, it's a pretty old uh, work, which you can see when you look at the TensorFlow version we use. Is it on the? Ah, it's not even on the slide, so <laughs> I'm lucky. So it's a pretty old uh, TensorFlow version we used here. Um, we set up this network, which is not particularly complicated. It's essentially an RNN residual-based neural network, um, which is a well a bunch of convolutional stacks with some skip connections that make the linear part pass through the whole update faster. So essentially, you shortcut the whole uh, or part of the layers with a linear connector. The idea between those, uh, behind those residual neural networks being that a linear or the linear part of your mapping is then learned very quickly. And the true convolutional part in the middle only has to learn the higher moments um, if you build in linear connection or linear, essentially you build in a linear basis function directly into your network. Okay, so we have a um, classical CNN network here and the only thing that we change with each, um, with each architecture is just how many of these layers we stack. So how deep does the network actually work? Let's look at some results. Um, first one is always look at the cost function. So how does the cost function behave for such a training? And the takeaway message here is, well, the cost function uh, actually decreases rather uh, monotonically, monotonically, <laughs> whatever, in a monotone manner. Um, and the deeper the network is, so the deeper we stack the layers, the lower the cost function also gets. So for this case, um, deep networks actually uh, fulfill that promise and learn better. We stopped somewhere, I had to stop somewhere because as we all know, neural networks are very data hungry. So at some point you have a point of diminishing returns and then you have to stop or you should stop the training. More results. Um, looking at the cross correlation and I'm comparing always a shallow neural network, R0 there, the zero stands for the depth and a deeper network with the four. And I'm looking at the cross correlation between the predicted Reynolds stresses or components of the Reynolds stresses. I'm just always comparing individual components and uh, the uh, true ones on the unseen test data, of course. And we can see something pretty nice here shown in this box that we get a pretty high correlation between the predicted stresses and the actual stresses. And this correlation I'll, I'll comment a second on why we have inner and, and outer ones, but th in this correlation is 0.7. And if you work with turbulence models or LES models, you don't know that 0.7 is a correlation that you, that's very, very high for such a model. Scale similarity models, 
They are in that range, 0.5 to 0.7 in a priori tests. The best, uh, most used model, the smagorinsky eddy viscosity model, has a correlation of 2% or so, or maybe zero, so better <laughs> is the truth. Um, so getting an actual correlation of about 0.7, that is very, very good. It's very high. Remember, these are, these are unknown, this is unknown data. This is the footprint of a nonlinear function projected onto the current space that you're looking at. And maybe just one comment why I've split this up into inner and uh, surface cross-correlations is uh, purely due to uh, machine learning reasons. Remember, I'm using a convolutional networks on these tiny cubes. And on the surfaces of these cubes, I have to do some padding just for technical reasons because my convolution filter is essentially sticking outside of, my, of the field I'm convolving it with. That's the reason why I'm losing accuracy at the surfaces. I'll skip this. This is not too interesting. Um, and I'll head right to a visual expression of what's going on here. And this is what, if you, if you come from turbulence background and um, you try to find models that, that do well, or try to predict the Reynolds stresses, I should say, this was a very encouraging and uh, surprising result. So on the left-hand side, I have a slice showing you a component of the Reynolds stresses on the unseen test data on one of these realizations. And these are the predictions of the ANN, particularly the one in the middle. So let me, let me put it that way. These are the terms that everybody has been trying to model for the last 40, 50 years with, with limited success, or varying success, I should say. And here with this machine learning model, we can actually go ahead and predict them. Well, not perfectly, but the main features are clearly visible in our predictions. So it's not a model, but it's a direct prediction of the Reynolds stresses. And you can see that this is, um, it's not like turning, making something out of nothing, but it's a very, very uh, encouraging, or it was a very, very exciting result for us. So we thought, hey, maybe we have this turbulence thing figured out. We just need to predict the Reynolds stresses, and then we're done. So the idea was, OK, if I now know what my what this closure term actually is, can I just not put that into my equation? Let me go back, maybe, to the beginning. Where was it? Here. If I can now predict this term here, right? I can just put it back in here and be done with it. I don't need to come up with a model term for this tau. Just need to predict it. And my machine learning tells me I can do this with a very uh, acceptable accuracy. And when we did that, this was no constraints incorporated in the training. This was just a very naive approach. Um, to my defense, it's like five years ago, so I didn't know, didn't know what I know now. Um, no constraints incorporated in the training, just do supervised learning, input-output. And we saw something that was uh, at first very encouraging and then very disheartening, which is what's, what's shown here. This needs a little bit of explaining. What's shown here in black is the actual kinetic energy decay curve of the true solution of the DNS. The gray curve is what the standard best model would give you. And our models here, they would look like this, so the blue and the uh, red and green one. And for a short period of time, this was very good, right? It wasn't perfect, but this was very good. Because we were predicting this actual Reynolds stress with a high accuracy. And a few seconds later, uh, this will blow up. Huh. We tried a lot of things back at the time. We tried to build soft constraints into our machine learning model by incorporating uh, essentially terms in the loss function that would make this more physically sound. For example, as I mentioned before, we know that this term, this small scales, they are dissipative in the mean. So let's, let's make sure that my Reynolds stress that I'm predicting is actually also dissipative in the mean. Um, 
There were other things that we tried. And I'm not going to show the results. I'm just going to tell you this works then for a little bit longer. <laughs> and then the same thing happens all over again. So a little bit confused at that time. I'll come back to that confusion in a minute. But I want to show you we are engineers, so we find a way to make matters worse, <laughs> I know, to make things work. Um, how to build an actually usable model from this. So we have a highly accurate prediction of the Reynolds stresses. We cannot use it directly. We don't, know, underst we don't understand fully why, but we cannot. We tried incorporating physical constraints in the machine learning process, didn't work. Let's try something else. Let's use this accurate prediction term here by the machine learning. And let's make our, or let's assume that our actual model that we are using has a certain functional form. And the most classical functional form it has is the so-called eddy viscosity model. So it's essentially like an artificial viscosity approach, just modifying the viscosity of the actual numerical scheme. Or if you're already running Navier-Stokes with a parabolic term, just tweak the viscosity coefficient that's already there. That's an artificial, uh, sorry, that's an eddy viscosity approach. So what we did was we say, hey, let's project our prediction for the Reynolds stresses. Let's just L2 project that onto the viscous flux term, meaning that this gives us the optimal eddy viscosity from this true Reynolds stress. So if I had the true Reynolds stress, and I would project that onto the model, I would get the best match coefficient. That's what L2 projection does. So that's what we did. We computed with our model the true Reynolds stresses. And then at each point in space, or at each element in space, and at each point in time, we compute an eddy viscosity that is varying in space and varying in time, and is computed from the L2 projection of the machine learning prediction. And here are the results, just briefly. Again, we have the same plot. We have the kinetic energy of the DNS. I think it's pretty hard to see on the, on the monitor or on the, on the screen here. That's the black line. Ah, sorry, that's the black one. That's the one. I got confused as well. That's the black line here. And all the other curves, they are different classical LES closure models. And the one that we are able to, especially the green one here, that's the classical Smagorinsky model. That's an eyeless up here. And with this approach, taking the optimal eddy viscosity constant informed by the machine learning model, we're able to get this red curve here, which you can see is nice and close to the actual DNS result. Uh, it's a little bit ambiguous in the spectrum. Um, that's kind of harder to interpret. But in this metric, you can actually see that it's a useful model, a useful machine learned model. But still, we didn't understand what was going on, why our model blew up when we thought we had a good prediction of the Reynolds stresses. So the idea was to say, OK, maybe we need a better prediction. And then we turn to sequence networks. Um, and I'll not talk about the sequence networks, gated recurrent units, uh, and LSTMs here. Uh, I'll just assume. Uh, that, that we kind of know what they are. So they are networks that take in temporal or sequence data and then make a prediction for um, the next time step or the next few time steps. So we changed the game and said, OK, let's take GRUs or LSTMs um, and do the same thing and just learn not from spatial data, but from temporal data. Of course, for Taylor, uh, for based on Taylor hypothesis, you, they are kind of interchangeable for this case. So let's, uh, let's see what that, what that gives us. OK, same idea. Uh, put in slices, temporal slices now. Store the data at some snapshots. And then put them in and have, again, the GRU or LSTM predict the Reynolds stresses. <laughs> it's trying to give me a heart attack. Um, I'll spare you, again, the technical details. Let's just say that um, we've seen for the CNN up here, the best cross-correlation we were able to get was about 70-something percent. With this approach, we're actually able to get 
100% accurate prediction of the Reynolds stresses on the unseen test data for the HIT case. So I'm, I'm qualifying this. I'm not saying I can predict the Reynolds stresses in any case from any situation. I'm saying for this case, we were able to actually predict them near perfectly. And to show you the visual impression of what this looks like, so in the left-hand plot, we have the Reynolds stresses for three different filter kernels. So I said you can essentially choose what filter kernel you want for your coarse graining to make sure that we didn't just hit something by accident. Uh, we put in three different filter kernels. This is a local L2 projection. This is a box filter. And this is a uh, global spectral polynomial cutoff filter, uh, sorry, Fourier cutoff filter. And these are all predictions. These are the best ones we're able to do with an MLP. You can see they're kind of getting that. But with the sequence networks, we're actually able to, to get the Reynolds stresses perfectly in the eyeball norm and very, very low actual quantifiable error. And now I was kind of certain that, OK, now we have solved the problem. Now with the perfect Reynolds stress, what could go wrong? And what can go wrong is something that's actually very simple and trivial, but sometimes you need to do, you need to learn the hard way. Um, I think Durezami calls this uh, model data inconsistency. Um, and the idea is, again, very straightforward, but sometimes you have to fall on your nose to see it. Um, imagine you're training something in a supervised learning manner, you have some input distribution, you're trying to find this mapping here that gives you this output distribution and you train the model. And now you put some new data in during inference and you're, at, you're, you're expecting it to predict something from this distribution. What you have overlooked is that the input distribution has actually shifted, right? This has a different PDF than the, the dark green curve. So there is no point in telling what the model will actually predict. It will most likely do an extrapolation and also predict something that is not from this distribution here. Okay, so it's essentially, as I said, model data inconsistency. You trained the model on one set of data and then you are surprised or should not be surprised when during inference you put another set of data in and you get another result out. We learned this by taking our perfect model, the one with 99.999% cross-correlation eyeball norm identical, and we put this again into our solver. And then we saw again something for the few first time steps, first couple of iterations. This gave, this was exact on the DNS. It was an exact match. So the coarse grained equations gave us the exact perfect evolution of the solution as would be the DNS data filtered. So it's something, um, yeah, that would be the dream of everybody building a model when, you're, when your coarse grained model gives you the same result as the fine grained model if you uh, apply the coarse graining operator again. And then it blew up and it kept blowing up. We tried again a lot of things to do, now more from the machine learning side of things. Um, there's something, I think it's by Bengio called stability training, which essentially makes the input, or applies some noise to the input, keeps the same output and tries to make the uh, network more robust against such noise. And the results were always the same. We could keep it stable for a little bit longer and then it would blow up. We analyzed something, uh, a distance measure, and this comes now back to this model data inconsistency I talked about on the previous slide. We're trying to understand what was going on, and when we looked at this Mahalanobis distance, which is, which is essentially just a multi-D point distance measure, we found the following. Whenever the model would blow up, we could see this or predict this in a spike in a sharp gradient in our Mahalanobis distance, telling us precisely what I mentioned before. From this point forward, the input into your machine learning model differs in this metric from the data you trained it on. So you're asking your um, machine learning model 
to extrapolate. This is nicely, you can nicely see this here in this distance measure. It just keeps blowing up and keeps blowing up. So that was a pretty hard lesson. Uh, we have accurately accurate closure terms. Stability is lacking. We can do stability improvements through incorporating physical constraints. We can do some improvements through uh, making the machine learning itself deal better with uncertainty, but it still blows up a bit. What's the, what's, the, what's the answer or what's the reason? Well, we have a chaotic nonlinear dynamical system and we are putting in some source term on the right hand side and we cannot expect this source term, slight deviations in this source term will give us different trajectories. If you have a Lorentz system, for example, and you just tweak the right-hand side of the Lorentz system by a tiny bit, it will, over time, give you very different trajectories from the original one. And this is what we had to learn here uh, by doing it. So, my quote here is, bad data in, bad, da bad data out. Have to be very careful in terms of um, how, you, how you think about your problem and just doing um, let's say supervised learning in a very uh, straightforward, maybe naive way for dynamical systems can go wrong very badly. I think we have to, let me, let me make one, that's my la last slide before the break and then we'll come to the rest after the break. So lessons learned, um, we can predict the closure terms in uh, turbulence with previously unattainable accuracy through machine learning. Uh, both approaches based on uh, spatial data only and temporal data only worked great for us. Uh, we couldn't actually use them in a stable computation. What did work was to project our prediction onto a functional form that we know is stable, an eddy viscosity model. Incorporating physical constraints helps but does not solve the problem. And later on, I'll talk about a new idea, how we actually solve this problem, or have solved this problem now. But that's for after the break. Thank you, and enjoy lunch. I think we have to leave, so if we can poke, or we can ask questions now whenever you want. Or. Thank you very much, Andrea, for your interesting talk. I have a question about the uh, technique and approach of uh, machine learning that uh, you implement in function of the turbulence modeling technique. Uh, there is, mm, uh, because th there is classical machine learning that you can use, but there is a um, possibility, the possibility to uh, adapt and maybe to transform the learning with the different layers like to go towards deep learning something like that to better predict uh, the results or to build the results or what do you think about that? Um, so I'm well I think this is not the end of the line and I think that um, We've, we've stopped working in this direction for the reasons I'll, I'll talk about after the break. But I think that the results that have been shown here, and these encouraging results, right, that without actually knowing, uh, incorporating the physics in a correct way, already being able to predict um, these, these nonlinearities with a high degree of accuracy. I think if I were to do this again from the bottom up, knowing what I know now, I think there is, this is, it's possible to make this work if you have a well-defined uh, filter, if you have a well-defined numerical scheme. Um, I don't see this working for uh, unstructured grids, wild computations. Um, 
I don't see, I don't think it can be done with a supervised learning manner for this very, very sensitive nonlinear dynamical system. But I might be wrong. Uh, again, after the break, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about why I think this is not the way forward. Uh, but this is specific to turbulence. This is not, this is not uh, a general sure. statement about supervised learning. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I think uh, we... Yeah, I think we will leave now because uh, we have to be on time at lunch. Thanks again. Thank you. And see you uh, in a few minutes.